Welcome, I'm Georgie Frost. Today we're gonna to be finding out a bit more about the wealth management platform, Exego. Combining quality and the strictest regulatory compliance with speed, Exego helps banks, financial service providers, and wealth managers to digitize their service offerings. The focus on the end customer enables Exego to create unique, innovative, and profitable wealth management services for their clients. Well, to talk more about this, I'm delighted to say I'm joined by CEO of Exego, Arno Piku. Welcome to you, Arno. Uh, if you would, just talk to me about the journey of Exego. What inspired its founding and how you've evolved as a company since then? Thank you, and thank you for having me today. So, um, yes, if we restart a little bit like 24 years ago, that's where Exigo was uh, created. So, really, we that was an anniversary that we celebrate a couple of months ago. So, it's really starting in the uh, behavioral economic. That's where everything started from the university. It was uh, created by a, a professor in, the, in that domain, and a couple of uh, very bright students embraced this uh, this main story, which was basically combining everything around psychology and uh, economics and what's the impact of how the people could behave. That's the way it's starting. And then they obviously starting building toolings and models to understand the impact on economics on different factors into behaviors moving forward to how those impact of the economy behavior can actually change the way you can manage wealth. So that was really the long time ago, the, the history. And then step by step, rather than repeating, they start building and building more and more tooling and models to create at the end a platform. And that's where really the starting point of the, the wealth, it was really about not wealth management, but managing wealth, which is by definition, it's a little bit slightly different because you, you know, most of the day when you think about wealth management is more about for very, uh, uh, very rich people. And actually it's not necessarily true. More and more the trend is to manage the wealth regardless if you earn a million per month or 100 euro is how do you manage whatever wealth you may have. And the models you may have, the economics where you are living actually impact what you have to do. So that was basically the source of, of Exigo and everything was developed in, in a region in Germany, in Aachen or also Aix-la-Chapelle, if you are a little bit more French history oriented. And yes, that was the beginning. Uh, university then moved to FinTech, get some a bit of funding and then step by step get more reward, a lot of big customers like in Germany, like Commerce Bank, BNP Paribas and Vantobel in Swiss, they and step by step, they start making their name out of this uh, this industry. And then uh, they wanted to scale more and then they hired more and more senior person uh, to uh, to make it a little bit more scalable and, uh, and spread a little bit more the knowledge into other country and other type of institutions. So that basically was the story. So it is your story. I suppose that's the practicalities of it. But what about the values, your core values? Talk to me about what they are, perhaps how they've developed and how these influence the culture and practice at Exigo. So this is a very good question. Be before I, I join, so I, I ask uh, to talk and to speak with a couple of customers and why did you pick Exigo? What's the What's the reason? What's the value? What did you find? And I, I, I remember really very well, like one of the things they said was obviously the, the people and the knowledge and someone make a, a parallel between the watch industry and the wealth tech industry. And he said, Exigo, it was like Philip Patek. We feel, the customers said, telling me, we feel special in that industry. And we wanted something special that really represent the DNA. Therefore, we were not necessarily looking for a fully 100% what you see is what you get like a standard, but we wanted something that understand us, understand what we are looking for and actually helping us to shape him, moving from um, a DNA vision to actually an actual product. And they found in Exigo, um, and they, the company has never been very big, but they found in Exigo people that understand the DNA of a customer and transform that into 
a new customer experience, of course, supported by technology. And Exigo has always been that. And when I ask, why did you pick Exigo? The people come always, were coming before the product. Oh, your people understand us. And yes, I could see in a in couple of weeks a journey that exactly represent our DNA and our story and what the way we would like to be perceived by our customer. And that's what's Exigo. Most of the time, the people before the product. So that's, I would say, what has been our, our DNA, which is the understanding. So this is a sort of a Philippe Patek. And if you know a little bit the watch industry, the Philippe Patek is designing watch based on the next customer and the activity of this customer and trying to capture from this customer what does he like? What the what does he like? What does he things represent for him? Form, shape, uh, sounds, uh, color, and then transform a watch that capture everything. But then Exigo was the same story: capture everything and represent that into a platform. That was Exigo main value. Now, I know every company, of course, faces challenges along their journey. So, what are some of the more significant ones that that you have faced? And and I guess how did you overcome them? And what lessons can you share with us? And can we take from that? That's, that's in fact, if you now turn what I just said about uh, this uh, sort of. Uh, individualization, make it special, the, 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 the challenge aspect is scalability. How do you scale this kind of skills um, outside of your market, outside of your German speaking area? Then that's become the real challenge because all the time we had to find new customer where wealth management or managing wealth is the main core business where they really wanted to reinvent. So basically, we had to find special customer where the the the, the individualizations or the, the wealth was something special for them. So that's obviously not in every corner, in every street. It's harder to find because it's always been a lot of investment. And if an, uh, an organization wants to deliver some Wealth services with a pretty vanilla, plain vanilla services, then it was much harder for us to get. If someone wants, okay, what you see is what you get, something cost effective, it's not my core business, but I need something to run. Then for us, we were a little bit lost because we were coming with our philippatic mindset. And then, so, yes, look, it's, and I remember some of the, project I have, I have seen the, the some of the business leader of the, the private bank said, look, this is amazing, but we just can't afford it. This is unbelievable, but can you make it cost effective and relatively cheap? And, and then then that's become actually not. And that's become was becoming our main problem. How could we keep our DNA, our main signature, like a chef in, in, a, in a kitchen, you have always his main signature. So not lose where we have been famous for, but in the same time, being able to address other markets, like in the watch industry, I don't know, the Mont Blanc market, it's a very interesting one, but it's much more scalable. So how could we do that? And our main challenge was to transform without losing that maker special, but make it more affordable, sort of democratizing the wealth to other segment where wealth management is not necessarily the primary goal, where budget is more limited and where they just want either to tick the box or replace an old system, but not more. So that's as our big challenge. And we still are facing it, uh, uh, but that's what we are gradually transforming. So that's a very honest answer. That's where we are facing a challenge. When we talk about digital and tech, particularly AI, it seems strange, but people are often overlooked, but they are, of course, absolutely key to this. So what are some of the skills that you look for in your future employees? How do you foster the development of those skills? So this, this is exactly, at the end, it's always about people's story. Whatever you do, whatever company, especially when you are a mid-size, small or mid-size, it's all about the people. And what you realize, if you want to transform, 
is extremely hard to do with employee that has been working here for two decades. And, and if I say that, it's, there's no thing negative. It just means when I arrived in Exigo was really most of the employees, first of all, they are all PhD minimum, minimum. So they are a lot of brilliant people coming from most of them. Um, so, so got diploma in the city of Aaron in the same university. Then they, they uh, most of the time their families coming from the same city. They married a husband or wife from the same city. They crossed the went to the university, crossed the street, then went to Exigo Street. So most of the core and the core of Exigo is passionate people where Exigo has been everything for them. But when you want to transform and inject something new with a new thinking API, and you mentioned open API, AI, and so on, you need new blood. So one of the things we have done is trying to understand how to enhance and bring new blood into the organization that match with what we have. There is no way we wanted to lose our extremely loyal and, and incredible people, with, but we wanted to add new asset and the people is our main asset that really really work out with a fantastic chemistry so what we have done is exactly adding one non german speaker nothing against the, the german but i was probably the only foreigner and the only one who could not speak german and actually never made the effort of speaking german because otherwise we will never move to somewhere else we have to. so and then we start adding Again, nothing against the German, but people that can coming from coming from a different background and most of the time different country. So that's the first things we have done, but always selecting carefully who we want to add. So we have gradually changed the culture by adding new capital, human capital asset around our core. So that's the way we have done it, and and. Uh, so far, it has worked well. So far, it has been very well uh, uh, received. Uh, and, and you have to understand, when you have been working and seeing foreigners coming, oh, who are those people? They don't speak the same language, really, et cetera, et cetera. So this is what we have done, adding new asset, new, obviously, younger generation that understand, that can bring us straight away something new because they knew it, like AI, for example, you, uh, if you have never been working with it, uh, it's not like you just get it like that. So that's what we have done so far. It's working well, and we continue to do that. I would like to add one more thing. Is is it a bit like starting last year? We also use more and more extremely experienced external consultants. So if you look at an organization which is different line of uh, of of organized line of competencies line of our department and in every department we're trying to inject for a certain period of time someone extremely experienced someone who was ceo or ceo or head of something or or someone who has an extremely high position to come to us and bring us something new so on top of hiring uh, uh, our own employee, we also inject in every line of the organizations new external consultant to bring us something new. Someone coming from outside, someone who has no political agenda, someone who has no ambition in the organization except helping us. And this all together between the new employee, the core family that we have, and the external, I think that really give us something new. And, and hopefully we are going to see soon uh, some new results to, to the market. But that's the way we fix our challenge, uh, which always start by the people. Arno, we are in a rapidly changing technological environment, also continued uncertainty in the economic environment. But I'm going to ask you what you think are some of the significant trends that you anticipate in the future and how Exigo is prepared and indeed positioned to benefit yeah from these changes? So obviously, if I don't mention uh, AI, that's in one hand is, is, is something probably you are expecting. In the other hand, if you don't mention, that's probably a mistake. So the, obviously, this uh, newer technology, we I think it's pretty clear that is going to um, change and make a, a 
I don't know if it's evolution or revolution, but really dramatically changed the story. Or not dramatically, it looks like negative, or significantly, and and uh, and uh, the, the the industry, including obviously the wealth management. So now the way we took it is, in the wealth management at the moment, you can see a lot of marketing buzz around AI. Oh, we have got uh, an MVP here. We have got a, a test here and there. But in reality, most of the use case in the wealth management, I'm talking about the wealth management specifically, those are use cases leveraging AI, which honestly, you could have done it before. So it's not like a huge revolution. So at the moment. So the way we took it at Exigo is a two-step approach. One is number one, you cannot really understand and expect delivering something new to your customer if already inside, you don't consume it. So we have a we launched a project last year where every department from sales, finance, marketing, development, service, uh, managed service, maintenance, everybody should have a project leveraging AI just to make sure that we are socializing and we are getting very used to uh, every on our daily life. On our daily life, we consume AI to improve our capability to generate marketing posting, a uh, uh, new way of coding, faster way of testing, whatever we could have or on the chatbot to answer questions, etc. So the first thing is making sure that internally AI is just become a business as usual, just to socialize and it's among the, including me. So that's the first part of the project. The second part, uh, luckily we have a very large customer like uh, LGT, uh, when we do a, a worldwide transformation project, or Raiffeisen, Vanto, BNP, and so on. And with most of them, we are starting sort of a brainstorming workshop about what AI could bring us. What what could AI create? What is the, the new use case that we could offer to citizen or business on the wealth management side that we could not do before? And that's, that's for us extremely important. We are not we are not here to do some marketing story just to be hey do you know we have a a, a new uh, a storyteller based on AI yeah but that's we already done that ten years ago without but something really new that bring a new value and and uh, so that's what we are looking for we are looking for something special not to make a buzz but something really new that bring that democratize even more so. We are not there yet. I'm just telling you what we do. We have several ideas, uh, again, sharing by customer. What you have also seen in industry in the AI is too many use cases without any adoptions. Everybody wants to do a prototype or MVP just to market and LinkedIn, whatever. We are not like that. We want to do something and we will announce when it's really valuable. So. We have those two steps. One, internally, making sure it's part of our daily life. Second, we are working with some of the big customers when we are brainstorming what could we do tomorrow to deliver value that doesn't exist today. So, so far, it's not ready yet, but we are working on. So that's the, the first trend. We are taking that uh, very seriously, and obviously we are moving on. The second is exactly what I said at the beginning. We are moving from wealth management to managing wealth, regardless your earning. And we believe this consuming consuming wealth at, at, at the origin of the needs is more and more important. And, and whatever you're earning, you, man, you need to manage your wealth properly. So one of our trends and what we can see is even non-financial Wealth management is on, you only first thing is you think about private banking. That's the first thing you think. But now actually more and more retail or non-financial institution are thinking to increase the stickiness to help people. As soon as there is a, a money exchange, actually with this money, we exchange together goods against money. Maybe we can also help to manage this money better. And we have several discussion we know with, with retailer for example who has nothing to do with financial with banking or financials but they want to start proposing some wealth management service sort of the point of sale point of sale or uh, when people start exchanging and discussing about money so here it's all about embedding the wealth at when you need it and, and where you need it so that's today it's a very big trend 
having the non-financial institution thinking deeply about who else. And if I phrase some of what of our people we are talking to are telling us is wealth management is the best way to increase the stickiness. Having a, a yes, I am a, a retailer and I have a, a credit card or a bank account in whatever uh, brand you know, it's not good enough. It's not loyal enough. What's bring the loyalty and the stickiness is as soon as you start, you start uh, managing and recommending how you could use better some of your saving you have, for example. So this is really democratizing the, the, cons the consumption of wealth service by non-wealth management specialists. This is a big trend. It's moving very high. And the demand is actually it's very interesting. So that's the second trend. And the third one is definitively uh, making, actually it's coming from the youngest generation. Youngest generation getting more and more aware of everything you heard about the ESG, SDG, and if I just zoom on the SDG, the 70 United Nations goals, people more and more are asking, uh, where are you investing my money? Where are, are uh, I have a pension fund, uh, typically in the UK, we are working with several IFA uh, to advise UK citizens on their pensions. More and more, I, I, I heard by, by discussing, uh, are asking, okay, I want to make sure that the money, my, my pension that you are currently investing are actually in a green economy, not the brown economy. So more and more, it's about bringing the smart sort of a smart investment, more and more green or making a real impact, not only ESG, but really SDG. I want to make sure that you have now scoring about invest possible investment. Or you say, if you invest here, this investment, this kind of fund, are targeting the, the, the following three uh, United Nations goals. This one, this one, and this one. But if you go to this one, is the law, is the following four United Nations goals, and it, it's making uh, better and better. So this is a new trend. More and more financial organizations, including the UK, really wants to be able to propose to their customer recommendation with a very, by scoring, recommendation by the positive impact it can bring to the planet, it can bring to the population, it can bring to the, the green economy. So that's really the third one. So to make it short, the first obviously is, is an AI impact, still work in progress. The second is democratizing wealth beyond financial institution, beyond private banking, regardless how much you can earn. And the third one is recommending smart investment, investment that can actually make a real positive impact. And compared to investment, this is really supporting by brown economy. This one is more green economy. This is the good impact you can make if you invest there. So that would be my three pick, basically. So let's continue to look to the future, but bring it a little bit closer to home. Where do you see Exigo in the next five to 10 years? I got the same question not long ago. I really believe you don't need to be big, uh, uh, enormous to be happy and and uh, and wealthy. You can be medium size and um, become indispensable for the business you are representing. And I think this is probably our destiny. We will never be, a, we are, our ambition is not to be a, a, a and then big respect to this gold big FinTech like SAP and my, we are not in this trend. We are focusing on for 24 years in the same business. And since I am at the CEO positions, our mandate has always been, we are not going to go wider, cover more, 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 even outside of waste management, but deeper. We want to continue to be the best at in this domain that we are managing since the creation of, uh, since ACO was born in the, this wealth and making sure that we can be consumed. Our destiny is to be consumed by third party. Uh, FinTech, core banking provider, we have now a signed contract with very large core banking provider that will be designing their wealth offering by white labeling some of our microservices. We want to, to, we want to be consumed by financial institutions that want to sell uh, fund or financial product with a wealth package by consuming us 
uh, as a vehicle to provide those funds. And of course, we want to be consumed by private banks. So the, the more we look at us is that we are, our main asset is our product. Our main asset is to be consumed and be relevant. Every time we think about wealth management, we want people to start thinking about, about Exigo and being consumed. So again, is be relevant in that domain, being a more and more, uh, uh, be able to be consumed in a cost-effective way. We can keep keep what we were before, where we were being famous, the sort of uh, this Philip Patek trend, but we can also deliver part of this, I would say, Formula One technology to something more humble and, and modest by just taking a, a pieces of this Formula One car, for example, but just to make it uh, uh, use, usable on your daily basis. So this is a, our trend, as I would, I would say, um, more be recognized in that domain because we are competent, not because we are, I don't know, 10,000 employees. We'll never be 10,000. That's not our goal. That's not. So that's where we are. It's like such a journey. And so far, it's really going well. Last year was exceptional. So now we have to uh, deliver all our promises, obviously, and continue on the, on the same track. CEO of Exigo, Arno Pico, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you.